This tutorial is sponsored by the 3D Coloring Book, a project specifically designed to help empower artists who are struggling with texturing in Substance Painter and to help show you that anyone can create beautiful pieces of art with just a little bit of practice and guidance. To instantly gain access to hundreds of pre-made professional level models and hours of high quality tutorials, click the link in the description and begin your journey today. Hey guys, my name is Riro, and in this video I'll be showing you a breakdown of my Dinosaur Hunter model. The concept is by Alberto Camara, and I actually made this for Dylan Akron's Creating Appealing Characters class, which took about 8 weeks to finish, and I hope you learned something new from this video. So in this video, I'll be showing you my process of making this model from blocking all the way to posing. And then I'll also show you my lighting setup in Blender when I'm rendering in Blender. A bit of a disclaimer here. I won't be covering a lot of technical stuff in this video. This video will mostly be about how I translate this concept from 2D to 3D using some of the design principles that I learned from this class. So let's get started. Before I start anything in ZBrush, I like to put my concept in Photoshop to do some sketches over it or sketches of it just to be familiar with the concept and also to separate the concept into parts so that it's easier for me to start in ZBrush. So here are some of the few things that I want to keep in mind of when I'm sculpting my characters. First being the line of action. The line of action is quite simple in this concept, it's quite straightforward and because of that I find it easier to just sculpt it in straight away instead of leaving it until the end when I'm posing the character. Another thing to keep in mind of is the silhouette itself. The simple versus complex side of the silhouette is what makes the design really unique. So I really want to make sure that I capture it in the final renders. And by using the negative spacing outside of the silhouette, I find that I can get a pretty good measurement of each part in relation to each other and it's better than eyeballing it and trying to get it right. So the next one is tapered shapes. Tapered shapes just makes the design more interesting in general. You can see it in the weapon itself where even though the weapon isn't an organic object, it still has a slight taper and a slight curve to it to give it more personality. By identifying these shapes, it helps to keep me from adding any unnecessary details in maybe like the legs where I can go overboard with the anatomy details on the legs and it will just ruin the silhouette and make it look too realistic. Finally, here are some of the smaller observations that I've made when I'm looking at this design. One thing that I really like about this design is that there's this line that goes from his head all the way down to his arm and it creates this really nice continuity that makes the silhouette look really clean and it's one thing that really stands out when you look at it from afar. There are other smaller things as well such as the smaller breaks and the curves versus straights in the silhouette that I want to keep accurate to the design when I'm sculpting. So for blocking, I would recommend using a base mesh that you maybe made for a previous character that has good topology or you know any base mesh that you can find. But in case if you don't have a base mesh, you can start from scratch and this is a pretty good method to get a good base going for your, your character. I like to use primitive shapes to make a mannequin similar to how Shane Olsen starts blocking out his characters. In this stage, I try to focus on the proportions and also the big shapes of the character. For the shapes themselves, I like to zero mesh them once at maybe like 0.1 or as low as possible just so that they are easy to move around and adjust in as few strokes as possible. When you're blocking a character, you want to avoid the stacking effect. This is when the shapes sit awkwardly above each other instead of flowing into each other to create a much smoother shape. As you can see in this draw over, the first mannequin looks really bumpy because the shapes don't really work together well, but in the second mannequin, you can see that you can create a smoother silhouette. This is a really exaggerated example, but you can always check for this stacking effect by applying like a flat material or just a dark uniform color over your model and checking it from every angle. Moving on, here is what I have for the second or third week or so. At this point, I'm trying to sculpt in the anatomy itself, which I think I went too overboard here. 
At this stage, I was struggling with making the anatomy look stylized but accurate at the same time. There are way too many details that aren't in the concept itself. To avoid getting overboard with the anatomy, I like to find 3D artwork as examples alongside my realistic anatomy references just to see how the other artists stylized it. So here are some of the references that I use to help me stylize the anatomy of my dinosaur hunter concept. So for example, um, Honda the Sumo Wrestler by Brandon Lawless. I use this picture to reference his anatomy in general, like the whole body, for example, the arms, the elbows, the uh, collarbone, and also his, his back muscles. My concept doesn't really have a back view and, you know, looking at how he's built, he's really tough, but he looks like he has been through some things and, you know, over the years he has lost his prime. He's not as muscular as he was before and that that's why he has some pudgy parts around him, like his waist and his arms. So, you know, looking at this sumo wrestler, I really like how his back, really no back muscle detail at all. It, it's just one line down the spine and then how I, I love how the fat folds around his waist there. That's what I want for my dinosaur hunter. You know, besides the sumo, I have these other bust references here. These are mainly for his facial features like how sharp the nose is and also uh, I want to maintain the really heavy brow meat. It's so heavy that it casts a shadow on his eye, that kind of look. That's what I want to go for. So I would really recommend trying to find other 3D artwork to compare to your real life anatomy references just to see how other people do it because there are so many ways that you can stylize anatomy. And there are a few good examples out there that you can try to apply to your concept. It just depends on what you want. You know, it's important to gather the right references, not just gather as much reference as possible. Okay, so here's what I have for my high res sculpt. I added in his props and sculpted details on it, like the boots. And I also sculpted in his face and hair. So for the hair, I used Dylan Ekron's hair tubes, which is available on Gumroad. I used it only for the white strands of hair, while the rest of it is sculpted. So for the sculpted parts of the hair, which is mainly the darker grey parts, I used the Orc Crack brush and also the Clay Build-Up brush. The reason why I don't use the hair tubes all over his hair is because in the concept itself, the, the hair doesn't really have a lot of details. It looks more like a big volume especially for his ponytails. It looks like it's one big mass, so that's why I chose to sculpt it instead of uh, using the hair tubes. So for polishing up your model, uh, a good trick I learned is to sculpt it from the inside out. And this is good for making clean creases without losing volume on your surrounding mesh, like the creases on the pants and the armpit area, the underarm area, where you need to have like a clean crease. To do this, you just need to hide a part of your mesh using Control shift kind of like dissecting it in half, and then you sculpt it from the inside as you normally would when you're sculpting on the outside. This method is also good for cleaning up your mesh too, you know, in case if you miss any bumpy areas or any areas that you need to smooth out, this method is good for that. So here is a quick look of the progression of his face from start to finish. While sculpting his face, I try to keep in mind the planes of his face and I try to adjust his proportions according to the highlights. Like you see that strong highlight on his chin and his jaw and also his forehead. Those really help in establishing the right proportions for his face as well as his overall look. So one thing I struggled with while I'm sculpting the head is the eye placement. Eye placement can be very tricky for stylized characters because every character's head shape is different. And the eye placement can change from one character to another just based on that. There is a rule of thumb that you can follow for good eye placement in characters. So here is a side view of an eyeball. Let's split the eyelids into four different parts, which will be the upper eyelid, the bottom eyelid, the inner corner and outer corner of the eyes. If we were to arrange it according to the depth, it should be the top first and then bottom the inner corner and the outer corner. The inner corner should always be a little bit further out compared to the outer corner of the eye. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that if you look at the eyeballs from the inside of the head and from the top, like see here if I cut the head open <laughs> here, the eyeball should be resting on the curve of the head. If you keep these two things in mind, you should be able to get a pretty good placement of the eyes. Now let's move on to posing the character. I like to use Transpose Master in ZBrush to pose my characters, and this works best if the mesh has subdivisions. The lower the subdivisions, the better. When posing the character, I like to split it up into smaller sections so that if I mess up, I won't have to start all over again, and it's just easier to manage. In the early stages, I don't expect to get the pose in one go. Some parts of the model will have to be resculpted, like for example, in this concept, one of his arms is folded, and so that will pose a lot of issues. But for now, I try to focus on nailing the overall silhouette and some of the notes that I made at the beginning. So to start, I like to establish the line of action in the model before I do anything else. For this concept, even though he's standing in a pretty symmetrical A pose, I like to break the symmetry just by twisting his upper body a little bit or even just shifting one of his feet. It gives the pose some variety and just make sure that it's not too boring. Also, when I'm posing the character in smaller sections, I try to keep the pose to look nice from all angles and I'll check for this between each section just to make sure that um, there are no tangents or any weird negative spacing here and there. Overall just to make sure that the character is recognizable from every angle. Finally, we are at the last stage, which is rendering. For this character, I decided to use Blender because I've always wanted to try Blender and this project is a good place to start. This is what my lighting setup looks like in Blender. In total, I have four lights, uh, one key light, one fill light, and two other rim lights. So the first one, this rim light is for his hair here. And then the second one, the second one is for the his body in general. It's really subtle, but it's for his arm here, like the weapon as well, and then also the small little window of his back. And then this one is a fill light. It's really subtle, but this is just to brighten up the lower part of his body a little bit. If I turn off the key light, you can see the rim light more clearly. To bring your model into Blender, you can always use the GOZ function, but for this one, I just exported an FBX file. When you export the FBX file, it will also export the polypaint that you did in ZBrush. You can find your polypaint info under Object Data Properties and under Vertex Color. So once you find it, go, go to the, your Shader tab, and then from there, you can see your Material node, and to plug it in, you just need to add an attribute and then you type in the whatever your polypane info is called. So mine is called color. Just type that in and then just link it into the base color. And your polypane should pop up on your model. And yeah, just do that for all of your models. Tweak your materials according to your liking and then just hit render. So that's the end of this video and thank you for watching. I hope you find this somewhat helpful. Mm -hmm.